14. Winter. Alex curled into the window seat at the hutch, and Dawes brought her a cup of hot chocolate. She'd placed a gourmet marshmallow at the top, the kind that looked like a rough-hewn stone yanked from a quarry. You went to the underworld, said Dawes. You earned a treat. Not all the way to the underworld. Then give the marshmallow back. She said it shyly, as if afraid to make the joke and Alex cradled her cup close to show she was playing along. She liked this Dawes, and she thought maybe this Dawes liked her. What was it like? Alex looked out over the rooftops in the late morning light. From here she could see the gray gables of Wolf's Head and part of the Ivy Tangle backyard, a blue recycling bin leaning tipsily against the wall. It looked so ordinary. She set aside her bacon and egg sandwich. Usually she could eat at least two herself, but she could still feel the water pulling her under and it was messing with her appetite. Had she really crossed over? How much was illusion and how much was real? She described what she could and what the bridegroom required. When she finished, Dawes said, You can't go to Tara Hutchins's apartment. Alex picked at her sandwich. I just told you about communing with the dead in a river full of golden-eyed crocodiles, and that's what you have to say? But apparently a taste of adventure had been enough for Dawes. If Dean Sando finds out what you did to Salome to get us into the temple, Salome may bitch to her friends, but she's not going to bring in the big guns. Offering us access to the temple, stealing from scroll and key, it's all. Too messy. And if she does? I'll deny it. And you want me to deny it too? I want you to think about what's important. And are you going to threaten me? Dawes kept her eyes on her cup of cocoa, her spoon circling around and around. No, Dawes. Are you afraid I will? The spoon stopped. Dawes looked up. Her eyes were a warm, dark coffee and sunlight caught in her messy bun making the red in her hair glow brighter. I don't think I am, she said, as if she was surprised by the fact herself. Your reaction was, extreme. But Salome was in the wrong. Dawes with the ruthless streak. Still, if the dean learns you made a deal with a gray. He won't. But if he does. You're afraid he'll call you out for helping me. Don't worry. I won't snitch. But Salome saw you. You might have to keep her quiet, too. Dawes's eyes widened, and then she realized Alex was kidding. Oh. Right. It's just. I really need this job. I get it, said Alex. Maybe better than anyone else who had ever sat beneath this roof. But I need something that belonged to Tara. I'm going to her apartment. Do you even know where she lived? No, Alex admitted. If Detective Turner figures out. What's Turner going to find out? That I went halfway to the underworld to talk to a ghost? I'm pretty sure that doesn't count as witness tampering. But going to Tara's apartment, going through her stuff, that's breaking and entering. It's interfering with an active police investigation. You could be arrested only if I get caught. Dawes gave a decisive shake of her head. You're crossing a line. And I can't follow if you're going to put both of us and Lethe at risk. Detective Turner doesn't want you involved and he'll do whatever he has to do to protect his case. Good point, Alex said, considering. So maybe instead of going around Turner, she should just go through him. Alex wanted to hide at the hutch and let Dawes make her cups of cocoa. She wouldn't have minded a little mothering. But she needed to go back to old campus, to renew her grasp on the ordinary world before the things that really mattered slipped away. She left Dawes in front of the dramat, but not before she'd asked about the name she'd heard, or thought she'd heard, spoken in the borderlands. Jean Dumond? Or maybe Jonathan Desmond? It doesn't ring a bell, said Dawes. But I'll do a few searches and see what the library has to say once I'm back at I.L. Bastone.
Alex hesitated, then said, Be careful, Dawes. Keep your eyes open. Dawes blinked. Why, she said. I'm nobody. You're Lethe, and you're alive. You're somebody. Dawes blinked again, like clockwork waiting for a cog to turn, for the right wheel to click so she could continue moving. Then her vision cleared and her brows knitted together. Did you see him? she said in a rush, staring at her feet. On the other side? Alex shook her head. North claims he isn't there. That's got to be a good sign, said Dawes. On Wednesday, we'll call him back. We'll bring him home. Darlington will know what to do about everything. Maybe. But Alex wasn't going to bet her life on waiting. Do you know much about the bridegroom murders? Alex asked. Just because she knew North's name, she didn't have to make a habit of using it. It would only strengthen their bond. Dawes shrugged. It's on all of those haunted Connecticut tours along with Jenny Kramer and that house in Southington. Where did it go down? I'm not sure. I don't like reading about that kind of stuff. You chose the wrong line of work, Dawes. She cocked her head. Or did it choose you? She remembered Darlington's story about waking in the hospital at age 17, with an four in his arm and Dean Sandoz's card in his hand. It was something they had in common, though it had never really felt that way. They approached me because of the topic for my dissertation. I was well suited to research. It was boring work until she broke off. Her shoulders hitched like someone had yanked on her strings. Until Darlington. Dawes brushed at her eyes with her mittened hands. I'll let you know if I learn anything. Dawes, Alex began. But Dawes was already hurrying back toward the hutch. Alex looked around, hoping to see the bridegroom, wondering if the gluma or its master knew she had survived, if an ambush would be waiting around the next corner. She needed to get back to the dorm. Alex thought of the passage the bridegroom had quoted from Idols of the King, the sinister weight of the words. If she remembered right, that passage was about Geraint's romance with Enid, a man driven mad by jealousy though his wife had remained faithful. It didn't exactly inspire confidence. Rather died than doubt. Why had Tara chosen those lines for her tattoo? Had she related to Enid or had she just liked the sound of the words? And why would someone from Scroll and Key share them with her? Alex couldn't imagine one of the locksmiths saying thank you for a particularly sweet high with a tour of the tomb and an education in its mythology. And even if Alex wasn't making something out of nothing, how had dealing weed to a few undergrads turned into murder? There had to be something more at play here. Alex remembered lying on her back at that intersection, seeing through Tara's eyes in her last moments, seeing Lance's face above her. But what if hadn't been Lance at all? What if it had been some kind of glamour? She swerved down High Street toward the Hopper College dining hall. She longed for the safety of her dorm room, but answers could protect her better than any ward. Even though Turner had warned her off trip, it was the only name she had and the only direct connection between the societies and Tara. It was early yet, but sure enough, there he was, seated at a long table with a few of his buddies, all of them in loose shorts and baseball caps and fleeces, all of them rosy-cheeked and wind-buffed despite the fact she knew they must be nursing hangovers. Apparently wealth was better than vitamin injections. Darlington had been cut from the same moneyed cloth, but he'd had a real face, one with a little hardness in it. As she approached, she saw Tripp's friends turn their eyes to her, assess her, discard her. She'd showered at the hutch, changed into a pair of lethe sweats, and combed her hair. After being shoved into traffic and drowning, it was all the effort she owed anyone. Hey, Trip, she said easily. You got a minute? He turned her way. You want to ask me to prom, Stern? Depends. Gonna be a good little slut for me and put out? Trip's friends hooped, and one of them let out a long oh shit. 
Now they were looking at her. I need to talk to you about that problem set. Tripp's cheeks pinked, but then his shoulders squared and he rose. Sure. Bring him home early, said one of his buddies. Why, she asked. You want seconds? They hooped again and clapped their hands as if she'd landed an impressive put. You're kinda nasty, Stern, Tripp said over his shoulder as she trailed him out of the dining hall. I like it. Come here, she said. She led him up the stairs, past the stained glass windows of plantation life that had survived the name change of the college from slavery, is a positive good Calhoun to Hopper. A few years back a black janitor had smashed one of them to bits. Tripp's face changed, eager mischief pulling at his mouth. What's up, Stern, he said as they entered the reading room. It was empty. She closed the door behind her, and his grin widened, like he actually thought she was about to make a move. How do you know Tara Hutchins? What? How do you know her? I've seen her phone logs, she lied. I know just how often you were in touch. He scowled and leaned on the back of a leather couch, folding his arms. The sulk didn't suit him. It pushed his round features from boyish sweetness to angry infant. You a cop now? She walked toward him, and she saw him stiffen, tell himself not to back up. His world was all about deferral, moving in sideways patterns. You didn't step to someone directly. You didn't look them in the eye. You were cool. You were fine with it. You could take a joke. Don't make me say I'm the law, Trip. I'll have trouble keeping a straight face. His eyes narrowed. What is this about? How stupid are you? His mouth fell open. His lower lip looked wet. Had anyone ever spoken to Trip Helmuth this way? It's about a dead girl. I want to know what she was to you. I already talked to the police. And now you're talking to me. About a dead girl. I don't have to. She leaned in. You know how this works, right? My job, the job of Lethe House, is to keep entitled little shits like you from making trouble for the administration. Why are you being such a hard ass? I thought we were friends. Because of all the beer pong we played and the summer we spent in Biarritz? Did he really not know the difference between friends and friendly? We are friends, Trip. If I wasn't your friend I'd have taken this to Dean Sando already, but I don't want hassle and I don't want to make trouble for you or for Bones if I don't have to. His big shoulders shrugged. It was just a hookup. Tara doesn't seem like your type. You don't know my type. Was he really trying to flirt his way out of this? She held his gaze and his eyes slid away. She was fun, he muttered. For the first time, Alex had the sense he was being honest. I bet she was, Alex said gently. Always had a smile, always glad to see you. That's what dealing was about. Tripp probably didn't understand that he was just a customer, that he was a pal as long as he had cash on hand. She was nice. Did he care that she was dead? Was there something more haunted than a hangover in his eyes, or did Alex just want to believe he gave a damn? I swear all we ever did was fuck around and smoke a couple of bowls. You ever meet at her place? He shook his head. She always came to me. Of course figuring out her address couldn't be that easy. You ever see her with anyone from another society? Another shrug. I don't know. Look, Lance and T were dealers. They got the best weed I've ever had, like the lushest, greenest shit you've ever seen. But I didn't keep track of who she hung out with. I asked if you saw her with anyone. He lowered his head more. Why are you being like this? Hey, she said softly. She squeezed his shoulder. You know you're not in trouble, right? You're going to be fine. She felt some of the tension ease out of him. You're being so mean. She was torn between wanting to slap him or put him to bed with his favorite binky and a cup of warm milk. 
I'm just trying to get some answers, Trip. You know how it is. Just trying to do my job. I feel you, I feel you. She doubted that, but he knew the script. Regular guy, Trip Helmuth. Working hard, or hardly working. She gripped his shoulder more firmly. But you need to understand this situation. A girl died. And these people she ran with? They aren't your friends and you aren't going to stay hard or not rat, or any of that crap you've seen in movies, because this isn't a movie, this is your life, and you have a good life, and you don't want to mess it up, yeah? Trip kept his eyes on his shoes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. She thought he might cry. So who did you see with Tara? When Trip was done talking, Alex leaned back. Trip? Yeah. He kept staring at his shoes, ridiculous plastic sandals, as if summer never stopped for Trip Helmuth. Trip, she repeated, and waited for him to raise his head and meet her eyes. She smiled. That's it. We're done. It's over. You don't ever have to. Think about that girl again. How you fucked her and forgot her. How you thought she might give you a good deal if you made her come. How it got you off to be with someone who felt a little dangerous. We good, she asked. This was the language he understood. Yeah. I'm not going to let this go any further, I promise. And then he said it and she knew he wouldn't tell anyone about this conversation, not his friends, not the bonesmen. Thank you. That was the trick of it, to make him believe he had more to lose than she did. One last thing, Trip, she said as he made to scurry back toward the dining hall. Do you have a bike? Alex pedaled across the green, past the three churches, then down to State Street and under the highway. She had about two hundred pages of reading to do if she didn't want to fall behind this week, and possibly a monster hunting her, but right now she needed to talk to Detective Abel Turner. Once you were off campus, New Haven lost its pretensions in fits and starts, dollar stores and grimy sports bars shared space with gourmet markets and sleek coffee spots, cheap nail salons and cell phone hubs set next to upscale noodle shops and boutiques selling small, useless soaps. It left Alex uneasy, as if the city's identity kept shifting in front of her. State Street was just a long stretch of nothing, parking lots, power lines, the train tracks to the east, and the police station was just as bad, an ugly, muscular building of oatmeal-colored slabs. There were dead spaces like this all over the city, entire blocks of massive concrete monoliths looming over empty plazas like a drawing of the future from the past. Brutalist, Darlington had called them, and Alex had said, it does sort of feel like the buildings are ganging up on you. No, he'd corrected. It's from the French, brute. As in raw, because they used bare concrete. But, yes, it does feel like that. There had been slums here before, and then money had poured into New Haven from the Model Cities program. It was supposed to clean everything up but they built places no one wanted to be. And then the money ran out and New Haven just has these, gaps. Wounds, Alex had thought at the time. He was about to say wounds, because the city is alive to him. Alex looked down at her phone. Turner hadn't replied to her texts. She hadn't worked up the nerve to call, but now she was here and there was nothing else to do. When he didn't answer, she hung up and dialed back again, and then again. Alex hadn't been anywhere near a police station since after Heli died. Not only Heli died that night. But to think of it in any other terms, to think of the blood, the pale pudding of Lynn's brain clinging to the lip of the kitchen counter, set her mind rabbiting around her skull in panic. At last Turner answered. What can I do for you, Alex? His voice was pleasant, solicitous, as if there were no one else he'd rather speak to. Reply to my goddamn texts. She cleared her throat. Hi, Detective Turner. I'd like to speak to you about Tara Hutchins. Turner chuckled, 
There was no other word for it. It was the indulgent laugh of a seventy-year-old grandfather, though Turner couldn't have been much over thirty. Was he always like this, at the office? Alex, you know I can't talk about an active investigation. I'm outside the police station. A pause. Turner's voice was different when he answered, a bit of that jolly warmth gone. Where? Right across the street. Another long pause. Train station in five. Alex walked Tripp's bike the rest of the way up the block to Union Station. The air was soft, moist with the promise of snow. She wasn't sure if she was sweaty from the ride or because she was never going to get used to talking to cops. She propped the bike against a wall by the parking lot and sat down on a low concrete bench to wait. A gray hurried past in his undershorts, checking his watch and bustling along as if afraid he was going to miss his train. You're not going to make that one, buddy. Or any of the rest. She scrolled through her phone, heaping one eye on the street as she searched Bertram Boyce North's name. She wanted a little context before she went asking the Lethe Library questions. Luckily, there was plenty online. North and his fiancée were celebrities of a kind. In 1854, he and his betrothed, the young Daisy Fanning Whitlock, had been found dead in the offices of the North and Sons Carriage Company, long since demolished. Their portraits were the first link under New Haven on the Connecticut Haunt site. North looked handsome and serious, his hair more tidily arranged than it had been in death. The only other difference was his clean white shirt, unmarred by bloodstains. Something cold slithered up her spine. Sometimes, despite her best efforts, she forgot she was seeing the dead, even with the gore splattered all over his fancy coat and shirt. Seeing the stiff, still black and white photo was different. He is moldering in a grave. He is a skeleton gone to dust. She could have what was left of him dug up. They could stand by the edge of his tomb together and marvel at his bones. Alex tried to shake off the image. Daisy Whitlock was beautiful in that dark-haired, stony-eyed way that girls of that time were. Her head was tilted slightly, only the barest hint of a smile on her lips, her curls parted in the middle and arranged in soft loops that left her neck bare. Her waist was tiny and her white shoulders emerged from a froth of ruffles, a posy of mums and roses clutched in her delicate hands. As for the factory where the murder had taken place, parts of it hadn't yet been finished at the time of North's murder and it was never completed. North and Sons moved their operations to Boston and continued to do business until the early 1900s. There were no photographs of the crime scene, only lurid descriptions of blood and horror, the gun, a pistol North had kept in his new offices in case of intruders, still gripped in his hand. The bodies had been discovered by Daisy's maid, a woman named Gladys Odenag, who had gone screaming into the streets. She'd been found nearly a half-mile away, hysterical, at the corner of Chapel and High. Even after a calming dose of brandy, she had little information to offer the authorities. The crime seemed an obvious one, only the motive offered any kind of intrigue. There were theories that Daisy had been pregnant by another man, but her family had hushed it up in the wake of the murders to avoid further scandal. One commenter suggested that North had been driven mad by mercury poisoning because of the time he'd spent near Danbury's hat factories. The simplest theory was that Daisy wanted to break off the engagement and North wouldn't have it. His family wanted an infusion of capital from the Whitlocks, and North wanted Daisy. She'd been a favorite of the local society columns and known as flirtatious, bold, and sometimes inappropriate. I like you already, murmured Alex. Alex scrolled past maps to both Daisy's and North's graves and was trying to zoom in on an old newspaper article when Turner arrived at the station. He hadn't bothered with an overcoat. Apparently, he didn't intend to stay long. Even so, the man could dress. He wore a simple, staid charcoal suit, but the lines were sharp, and Alex saw the careful touches, the pocket square the thin lavender stripe on the tie. 
Darlington had always looked good, but effortlessly so. Turner wasn't afraid to look like he tried. His jaw was set, his mouth a pinched seam. It was only when he spotted Alex that his mask of diplomacy dropped into place. His whole bearing changed, not just his expression. His body went loose and easy, unthreatening, as if actively discharging the current of tension that animated his form. He sat down beside her on the bench and rested his elbows on his knees. I need to ask you not to show up at my place of work. You didn't answer my texts. There's a lot going on. I'm in the middle of a homicide investigation, as you know. It was that, or go to your house. That live wire tension sprang back into his body, and Alex felt a jolt of gratification at being able to rile him. I suppose Lethe has all of my particulars on file, he said. Lethe most likely did know everything from Turner's social security number to his tastes in porn, but no one had ever offered Alex a look at the file. She didn't even know if Turner lived in New Haven proper. Turner checked his phone. I have about ten minutes to give you. I'd like you to let me talk to Lance Gressing. Sure. Maybe you'd like to run his prosecution, too. Tara wasn't just connected to Trip Helmuth. She and Lance were dealing to members of Scroll and Key and Manuscript. I have names. Go on. They're not something I can disclose. Turner's face was still impassive, but she could feel his resentment building with each moment he was forced to indulge her. Good. You come to me for information, but you're not willing to share yours, he asked. Let me talk to Gresseng. He is the chief suspect in a murder investigation. You understand that, right? A disbelieving smile had crept up his lips. He really thought she was stupid. No, entitled. Another trip. Maybe another Darlington. And he would like this version of her better than the one he'd met at the morgue. Because this version could be intimidated. All I need is a few minutes, she said adding a whiny note to her voice. I don't actually need your permission. I can make the request through his lawyer, say I knew Tara. Turner shook his head. Nope. As soon as I leave this meeting I'm calling him and letting him know there's a crazy girl trying to insert herself into this case. Maybe I'll give him a look at the video of you running around Elm Street like some kind of fool. A bolt of shame shook Alex as she thought of herself writhing in the middle of the road, cars swerving around her. So Sando had shared the video with Turner. Had he shared it with anyone else? The thought of Professor Belbaum seeing it made her stomach churn. No wonder the detective was doubly smug with her today. He didn't just think she was stupid. He thought she was unhinged. Even better. What's the big deal? Alex said. Turner's fingers flexed on the immaculately pressed legs of his suit. The big deal? I can't just sneak you in there. All visitors to a jail are logged. I have to have a good official reason to bring you there. His attorneys have to be there. The whole thing will have to be recorded. You're telling me cops always follow the rules? Police. And if I bent the rules and the defense found out, Lance Gressing would get away with murder and I'd lose my job. Look, when I went up to Tara's place. Turner's gaze snapped to her, eyes blazing, all pretense of diplomacy gone. You went to her house? If you cross that tape. I needed to know if. He shot to his feet. This was the real Turner, young, ambitious, forced to dance to make his way in the world and sick of it. He paced back and forth in front of the bench, then pointed a finger at her. Stay the fuck away from my case. Turner. Detective Turner. You are not going to mess with my case. I see you anywhere near Woodland, I will fuck your life so hard, you'll never walk straight again. Why are you being such a hard-ass, she whined, cribbing a line from Trip. This isn't a game for you to play. You need to understand how easy it would be for me to take your life apart, 
to find a little stash of weed or pills on you or in your dorm room. Get that. You can't just, Alex began, eyes wide, lip wobbling. I'll do whatever I have to do. Now get out of here. You have no idea the line you're walking, so do not press me. I get it, okay? Alex said meekly. I'm sorry. Who did Trip say he saw with Tara? Alex didn't mind sharing the names. She'd meant to from the start. Turner needed to know that Tara had been dealing to students who weren't in her phone logs, using a burner or a phone lance had hidden or destroyed. She looked down at her gloved hands and said quietly, Kate Masters and Colin Catry. Kate was in manuscript, but Alex barely knew her. The last time she'd spoken to her had been the night of the Halloween party, when she and Mike Awalowo had begged her not to tattle to Lethe about drugging Darlington. She'd been dressed as Poison Ivy. But Colin she knew. Colin worked for Bellbaum, and he was in Scroll and Key. He was cute, tidy, as preppy as they came. She could imagine him relaxing with an outrageously expensive bottle of wine, not hotboxing with town goods. But she knew from her time at Ground Zero, appearances could be deceiving. Turner smoothed his lapels, his cuffs, ran his hands over the clean sides of his head. She watched him put himself back together, and when he smiled and winked it was as if the angry, hungry Turner had never been there. Glad we had this chat, Alex. You let me know if there's anything at all I can do to help you out in the future. He turned and marched back toward the hulking form of the police station. She hadn't liked whimpering in front of Turner. She hadn't liked being called crazy. But now she knew what street Tara had lived on, and the rest would be easy. Alex was tempted to go directly to Woodland and find Tara's apartment, but she didn't want to try to do her snooping on a Sunday, when people would be home from work. It would have to wait until tomorrow. She hoped that whoever had sent the gluma after her thought she was still laid up at the hutch, or dead. But if they were watching her, she hoped they'd seen her talking to Turner. Then they'd think the police knew what she knew, and there'd be no point to shutting her up. Unless somehow Turner is in on all of it. Alex shook the thought from her mind as she pedaled back toward the hopper gates. Cautious was helpful, paranoid was just another word for distracted. She texted Trip to let him know where she'd dumped his bike inside the gate and headed across old campus, turning over Tara's ties to the societies. The gluma suggested the involvement of Book and Snake, but so far it didn't look like Tara had been dealing to anyone in that society. Trip connected her to Skull and Bones, Colin and that weird tattoo connected her to Scroll and Key, Kate Masters tied her to Manuscript, and Manuscript specialized in glamours. If someone had been dressed in magic that night, pretending to be Lance, Manuscript was probably involved. That could explain why Alex had seen Lance's face in Tara's memory of the murder. But all of that also assumed Tripp's information was good. When you were scared you'd say anything to get yourself out of a bad situation. She should know. And Alex had no doubt that Tripp would happily sell out whoever first came to mind to get himself out of trouble. She supposed she could take those names to Sando, explain that Turner would now be hunting down their alibis, try to make him reconsider Lethe's involvement in the investigation. But then she'd have to explain that she'd badgered the information out of a bonesman. Alex had to be honest with herself, too. Something in her had shaken loose when the Gluma attacked, the real Alex coiled like a serpent in the false skin of who she pretended to be that Alex had snapped her jaws. Closed on Salome, bullied Trip, manipulated Turner. But she had to be careful. It's essential that they see you as stable, reliable. She didn't want to give Sando any more excuses to sever her from Lethe and her only hope of staying at Yale. Alex felt a rush of relief as she climbed the steps to Vanderbilt. She wanted to be behind the wards, to see Lauren and Mercy and talk about work and boys. She wanted to sleep in her own narrow bed. But when Alex entered the suite, the first thing she heard was crying. 
Lauren and Mercy were on the couch. Lauren had her arm around Mercy and was rubbing her back as Mercy sobbed. What happened? Alex said. Mercy didn't look up and Lauren's face was harsh. Where have you been? She snapped. Darlington's mom needed help with something. Lauren rolled her eyes. Apparently, the family emergency excuse was past retirement. Alex sat down on the battered coffee table, her knees bumping Mercy's. Mercy had her head buried in her hands. Tell me what's going on. Can I show her? said Lauren. Mercy released another sob. Why not? Lauren handed over Mercy's phone. Alex slid unlock on the screen and saw a text string with someone named Blake. Blake Keeley? He was a lacrosse player, if she remembered right. There was a story about him kicking a kid from a rival team in the head during a game in high school. The player had been on the ground at the time. Every college had revoked his scholarship, every college but Yale. The lacrosse team had been Ivy League champs for years running, and Blake had landed a modeling gig with Abercrombie and Fitch. His posters were plastered all over the store's windows on Broadway, giant black and white images of him emerging shirtless from a mountain lake, hauling a Christmas tree through a snowy wood, snuggling a bulldog puppy by a roaring fire. You were hot last night. All the brothers agree. Come by again tonight. There was a video attached. Alex didn't want to press play, but she did. The sound of raucous laughter blared from the phone, the thump of a bass track. Blake said, Hey, hey, we have such a pretty girl, something exotic on the menu tonight, right? He turned the camera on Mercy, who laughed. She was sitting in another boy's lap, her velvet skirt hiked high on her thighs, a red solo cup in her hand. Shit. Omega meltdown. Alex had promised Mercy she'd go with her, but she'd completely forgotten. Take it in the other room, said Lauren as Mercy wept. Hurriedly, Alex entered her bedroom and shut the door. Mercy's bed was unmade. That, even more than her sobbing, was a sure sign of distress. In the video Mercy's skirt was pushed up to her waist, her panties pulled down. Jesus, look at all that bush. Blake giggled, a high, giddy sound, his eyes tearing with laughter. It's so straight. You doing good, hon? Mercy nodded. Haven't had too much to drink? You're sober and consensual, as they say? You bet. Mercy's eyes were bright, lively, alert, not glazed or heavy-lidded. She didn't look drunk or like she'd been roofied. On your knees, Han, time for Chinese takeout. Mercy knelt, her dark eyes wide and wet. She opened her mouth. Her tongue was stained purple from the punch. Alex paused the video. No, not the punch. She knew that color. That was how those servants had looked that night at manuscript. That was Marity, the drug of service, taken by acolytes to give up their will. The door opened and Lauren slipped inside. She won't let me take her to the health center. They're rapists. We should be going to the cops. They should be good for that at least. You saw the video. She told me she barely drank. She was drugged. I thought so too, but she isn't acting like it. She doesn't look like it. Did you watch it? Part of it. How bad does it get? Bad. How many guys? Just the two. She thinks he's going to send it around to his boys if he hasn't already. Why weren't you with her? I forgot. Alex didn't want to say it. Because, yes, a girl had been murdered and Alex had been attacked, but at the end of the day, Alex hadn't spared a second thought for Mercy, and Mercy deserved better. She deserved a night out to have fun and flirt, and maybe meet a cute boy she could kiss and take to a formal. That was why Alex had agreed to go to a mega meltdown with her. She owed Mercy, who had been kind to her and helped with Alex's papers and never pitted, 
just pushed her to do better. But she'd forgotten all about the party after the Gluma attack. She'd gotten caught up in her fear and desperation and her desire to know why she was being hunted. Who did she go with? Alex asked. Charlotte and that crew from upstairs. Lauren's voice was an angry growl. They just left her there. If Mercy was under the influence of Maridi, then she would have said she was fine, that they should leave, and they wouldn't have known her well enough to argue with her. But if Alex had been there, she would have seen Mercy's purple tongue. She could have stopped this. Alex put her coat back on. She took a screenshot of the video and sent it to her own phone showing Mercy's mouth open, her purple tongue out. Where are you going? Lauren whispered furiously. Does Darlington's mom need some more help? To fix this. She doesn't want us talking to the police. I don't need the police. Where does Blake live? The Omega House. Up on Linwood, in the filthy frat row that had sprung up when the university had kicked the fraternities off campus years ago. Alex, said Lauren. Just try to keep her calm, and don't leave her alone. Alex strode back out of Vanderbilt and across old campus. She wanted to go straight to Blake, but that would do no good. A group of greys flickered in the corner of her vision. Aurora lost decorage, she spat. Her grandmother's curse felt good on her tongue. Let them be swallowed alive. All of her anger must have gathered in the words. The greys scattered like birds. And what about the gluma? If it was out there hunting, would it go running? She would have been glad for a glimpse of the bridegroom, but she hadn't seen him since their encounter in the borderlands. Alex knew she shouldn't have riled Detective Turner. He might have been willing to help if she hadn't messed with him. It was possible he still would. Part of her belief he really was one of the good guys. But she didn't want to rely on Turner or the law or the administration to fix this. Because the video would still be out there, and Blake Keeley was rich and beautiful and beloved, and there was a big difference between things being fair and things being set right. 15. Winter. Alex hadn't been back to manuscript since the Halloween party. That night, she'd stayed with Darlington at Black Elm, trying to keep warm in his narrow bed. She'd woken to dawn light trickling through the room and Darlington curled behind her, asleep. He was hard again, the ridge of him tucked against the curves of her ass. One of his hands was cupped over her breast his thumb moving back and forth over her nipple with the lazy rhythmic sway of a cat's tail. Alex felt her whole body flush. Darlington, she had snapped. Mmm, he murmured against the back of her neck. Wake up and fuck me, or cut that out. He froze, and she felt him wake. He rolled off the bed, stumbling, tangled in covers. I didn't. I'm sorry. Did we? She rolled her eyes. No, those assholes. A rare swear, but a deserved one. His eyes had been bloodshot, his face haggard. It would have been worse if he'd known that the report she showed him over breakfast bore no resemblance to the one she'd actually sent to Dean Sando. The manuscript tomb looked even uglier beneath a noon sun, the circle hidden in its brickwork seeming to appear then disappear as Alex approached the front door. Mike Awalowo waved her inside. The big room and the yard beyond looked airy, safe, all signs of the arcane buried deep beneath the surface. I'm glad you reached out, he said, though Alex doubted that was true. He was an international studies major and had the intense, friendly poise of a daytime talk show host. Alex glanced over his shoulder and was happy to see the place seemed empty. Now that Kate Masters was on Alex's suspect list, she didn't want to complicate things. Time to settle up. Mike's expression was resigned, the look of someone sitting in a dentist's chair. What do you need? A way to call back something. A video. If it's gone viral, there's nothing we can do. I don't think it has, not yet, but it could tip any minute. 
How many people have seen it? I'm not sure. Right now maybe a handful. That's a big ritual, Alex. And I'm not even sure it would work. Alex held his gaze. The only reason you're even up and functioning is because of the report I filed on Halloween. The night of the party, she and Darlington had stormed out of the tomb, or done their best to, Mike and Kate trailing after in their Batman and Poison Ivy costumes. Darlington was wobbly on his feet, blinking at everything as if it was too bright, clinging hard to her arm. Please, Awalowo had begged. This wasn't sanctioned by the delegation. One of the alumni had a bug up his ass about Darlington. It was supposed to be a joke. Nothing happened, said Kate. That wasn't nothing, Alex retorted, dragging Darlington farther down the block. But Awalowo and Masters had followed, arguing, and then making offers. So Alex had propped Darlington against the Mercedes and made a deal, a favor for a softening of the report. She described the drugging as an accident and manuscript had faced nothing but a fine, when otherwise they would have been suspended. She'd known eventually Darlington would find out, when harsher sanctions never materialized. If nothing else, she'd get a stern lecture on the difference between morals and ethics. But then Darlington had disappeared, and the report had never been an issue. She knew it was a punk move, but if she survived her freshman year, Lethe would be her show to run. She had to do things her way. Awalowo crossed his arms. I thought you did that to save Darlington's pride. I did it because the world runs on favors. Alex rubbed a hand over her face, trying to shake a sudden wave of fatigue. She held up her phone. Look at her tongue. Someone's using one of your drugs to mess with girls. Mike took the phone in hand and frowned at the screenshot. Maridi? Impossible. Our supplies are locked down. Someone could be sharing the recipe. We know what the stakes are. And we all have strong prohibitions placed on us. We can't just walk around talking about what we do here. Besides, it's not a question of knowing a formula. Maridi only grows in the greater Shingon Mountains. There's literally one supplier, and we pay him a very steep fee to only sell to us. Then where had Blake and his friends gotten it? Another mystery. I'll look into it, Alex said. But right now I need to fix this. Mike studied Alex. This isn't Lethe business, is it? Alex didn't answer. There's a threshold for media. It varies for music, celebrity, memes but if you pass it, no ritual can call it back. I guess we could try to reverse the full cup. We use it to build momentum for projects. That's what we did for Mitch's single last September. Alex remembered Darlington's description of the society members gathered naked in a huge copper vat, chanting as it filled gradually with wine that bubbled up from some invisible place beneath their feet. The full cup. It had been enough to get a very mediocre single to number two on the dance charts. How many people would you need for it? At least three others. I know who to talk to. But it will take a while to prepare. You'll need to do everything you can to stanch the bleeding in the meantime, or none of it will matter. Okay. Call your people. As fast as you can. She didn't like the idea of Kate Masters being involved but mentioning her name would only raise questions. You're sure? Alex knew what Mike was asking. This was a violation of every Lethe protocol. I'm sure. She was already at the door when Mike said, Wait. He crossed to a wall of decorative urns and opened one, then drew a small plastic envelope from a drawer and measured out a tiny portion of silver powder. He sealed the envelope and handed it to Alex. What is it? Star power. Astrum Salinas. It's salt skimmed from a cursed lake where countless men drowned, in love with their own reflections. Like Narcissus? The lake bed is covered in their bones. 
it's going to make you really convincing for about 25 to 40 minutes. Just promise me you'll find out where that creep got the moriety. Do I snort it? Sprinkle it over my head? Swallow. It tastes awful, so you may have trouble keeping it down. You're going to have a brutal headache after it wears off, and so will everyone you came in contact with. Alex shook her head. So much power just left on the mantle for anyone to seize. What was in the rest of those urns? You shouldn't have these things, she said, thinking of Darlington's wild eyes, of mercy on her knees. You shouldn't be able to do this to people. Mike's brows rose. You don't want it? I didn't say that. Alex folded the envelope into her pocket. But if I ever find out you used something like this on me, I'll burn this building down. The house on Linwood was two stories of white wood and a porch sagging beneath the weight of a moldy couch. Darlington had told her that Omega once had a house in the alley behind Wolf's Head, a sturdy stone cottage full of glowing brown wood and leaded glass. Their letters were still worked into the stone, but Alex found it hard to imagine parties like Omega Meltdown and sex on the beach in what looked like a cozy tea room for Scottish spinsters. Fraternity culture wasn't quite the same then, Darlington had said. They dressed better, dined formally, took the gentleman and scholar's bit seriously. Gentleman scholar seems like a good description for you. A true gentleman doesn't boast of the title and a true scholar has better uses for his time than downing flaming Dr. Pepper shots. But when Alex had asked why the frat had been kicked off campus, he'd only shrugged and underlined something in the book he was reading. Times changed. The university wanted the property and not the liability. Maybe they should have kept them on campus. You surprise me, Stern. Sympathy for the brotherhood of keg stands and misplaced aggression? Alex thought of the squat on Cedros. Make people live like animals, they start acting like animals. But animal was too kind a term for Blake Keeley. Alex took the plastic packet from her pocket and downed the powder inside. She gagged instantly and had to pinch her nose shut, covering her mouth with her fingers to keep from spewing the substance back up. The taste was fetid and salty, and she desperately wanted to rinse her mouth out but she forced herself to swallow. She didn't feel any different. Jesus, what if Mike had been messing with her? Alex spat once in the muddy yard, then climbed the stairs and tried the front door. It was unlocked. The living room stank of old beer. Another busted couch and a lazy boy recliner were arranged around a chipped coffee table covered in red solo cups and a banner with the house's letters had been hung above a makeshift bar with two mismatched stools in front of it. A shirtless guy in a backward baseball cap and pajama pants was picking up scattered cups and shoving them into a big black garbage bag. He startled when he saw her. I'm looking for Blake Keeley. He frowned. Uh? You a friend of his? Alex wished she'd been in less of a hurry back at manuscript. Just how was the star power supposed to work? She took a breath and gave him a big smile. I'd really appreciate your help. The guy took a step backward. He touched his hand to his heart as if he'd been punched in the chest. Of course, he said earnestly. Of course. Whatever I can do. He returned her smile and Alex felt a little ill. And a little wonderful. Blake. He called up the stairs, gesturing for her to follow. He had a bounce in his step. Twice on the way up he turned to look at her over his shoulder, grinning. They reached the second floor and Alex heard music, the thunderous rattle of a video game being played at full volume. Here, the beer smell receded and Alex detected the distant whiff of some very bad weed, microwave popcorn, and boy. It was just like the place she'd shared with Len and Van Nuys. Shabby in a different way maybe, the architecture older, dimmer without the clean gilding of a Southern California sun. Blake, the shirtless boy called again. He reached back and took Alex's hand with an utterly open smile. 
a giant poked his head out of a doorway. Geo, you fuck, he said. He wore shorts and was shirtless too, cap backward like it was some kind of uniform. You were supposed to clean the toilet. So Geo was a pledge or some other kind of lackey. I was cleaning downstairs, he explained. Do you want to meet? Oh God, I can't remember your name. Because she hadn't said it. Alex just winked. Clean the fucking toilet first, the giant complained. You cockshiners can't just keep shitting on top of shit. And who the hell is? Hi, said Alex, and, because she never had, she tossed her hair. I eh hey. Hi. How are you? He tugged his shorts up then down, removed his cap, ran a hand through his tufty hair, set the cap back in place. Hi. I'm looking for Blake. Why? His voice was mournful. Help me find him? Absolutely. Blake, the giant bellowed. What? demanded an irritated voice from a bedroom down the hall. Alex didn't know how much time she had left. She shook off Geo the lackey's hand and forged ahead, making sure not to look into the bathroom as she passed. Blake Keeley was slouched on a futon, sipping from a big bottle of Gatorade and playing Call of Duty. He was at least wearing a shirt. She could sense the other boys hovering behind her. Where's your phone? Alex asked. Who the fuck are you? Blake said, tipping his head back and assessing her with a single arrogant glance. For a moment, Alex panicked. Had Mike's magic powder worn off so fast? Was Blake somehow immune? Then she remembered the way the powder had burned her throat. She yanked the cord from the wall and the game went silent. What the? I'm so sorry, Alex said. Blake blinked, then gave her a lazy, easy smile. That's his pantadropper grin, thought Alex, and considered knocking his teeth in. No worries at all, he said. I'm Blake. I know. His grin widened. Have we met? I was pretty wasted last night, but... Alex shut the door and his eyes widened. He looked almost flustered, but utterly delighted. A kid on Christmas. A rich kid on Christmas. Can I see your phone? He stood and handed it over, offering her his spot on the futon. Do you want to sit? No, I want you to stand there looking like an asshole. He should have reacted, but instead he just stood smiling obediently. You're a natural. She gave the phone a shake. Unlock it. He obliged and she found his gallery, pressed play on the first video. Mercy's face appeared, smiling and eager. Blake stroked the wet head of his penis against her cheek and she laughed. He turned the camera back on himself and gave his stupid, shit-eating grin again, nodding as if to the viewers at home. Alex held up the phone. Who did you send this video to? Just a couple of the brothers. Jason and Rodriguez. Get them in here, make them bring their phones. I'm here, said the giant from behind the door. She pulled it open. I'm Jason. He was actually raising his hand. While Blake scampered off to find Rodriguez and Jason the giant waited patiently, Alex found the texts he'd sent, deleted them, then deleted the rest of his messages for good measure. He'd obligingly named one of his photo albums Pussy Vault. It was full of videos of different girls. Some of them were bright-eyed and had purple tongues, some just looked wasted, drunk. Girls with glazed eyes, their tops off or pushed to the side. One girl was so far gone only the whites of her eyes were visible, appearing and disappearing like slivers of moon as Blake fucked her, another with vomit in her hair, her face pressed into a pool of sick as Blake took her from behind. And always he turned the camera back on himself, as if he couldn't resist showing off that star-worthy smile. Alex wiped the photo and video files clean, though she couldn't be sure they weren't backed up somewhere. Jason's phone was next. 
either he had a shred of a conscience or he'd been too hungover to send the video to anyone yet. She heard panting from down the hall and saw Blake dragging Rodriguez along the filthy carpet. What are you doing? You said to get him, said Blake. Just give me his phone. Another quick check. Rodriguez had sent the video to two friends, and there was no way of knowing who they'd passed it along to. Damn it. Alex could only hope that Mike had succeeded in gathering enough members of manuscript, and that reversing the full cup would work. Did they know? Alex asked Blake. Did they know about the Maridi? That Mercy was drugged? No, Blake said, still smiling. They just know I don't have a problem getting laid. Where did you get the Maridi? A guy from the forestry school. The forestry school? There were greenhouses up there with regulated temperature gauges and moisture control, designed to recreate environments from all over the world, maybe one just like the greater Shingon Mountains. What had Tripp said? Lance and T had the lushest, greenest shit you've ever seen. What about Lance Gressang and Tara Hutchins, she asked. Yeah. That's them. You know Lance? Did you hurt Tara? Did you kill Tara Hutchins? Blake looked confused. No. I would never do something like that. Alex really wondered where he thought he was drawing a line. An ache had started to throb in her right temple. That had to mean the star power was going to wear off soon. And she just wanted to get out of here. The house. Made her skin crawl, as if it had absorbed every sad, sordid thing that had happened within its walls. She looked down at the phone in her hand, thought of Blake's girls lined up in their galleries. She wasn't done just yet. Come on, she said, glancing back down the hall to the open door of the bathroom. Where we going? Blake asked, his lazy grin spreading like a broken yoke. We're going to make a little movie. 16. Winter. Lauren had given Mercy an Ambien and put her to bed. Alex stayed with her, dozing in the darkened room, waking in the late evening to Mercy's snuffling tears. The video is gone, Alex told her, reaching down to clasp her hand. I don't believe you. It can't just be gone. If it was going to break it would have broken. Maybe he wants to hold it over my head so that I come back and do things. It's gone said Alex. There was no real way of knowing if Mike's ritual had worked. The full cup was meant to build momentum, not drain it, but she had to hope. Why would he pick me? Mercy asked again and again, searching for logic, for some equation that would make this all add up to something she'd said or done. He could have any girl he wanted. Why would he do that to me? Because he doesn't want girls that want him because he grew weary of desire and developed a taste for causing shame. Alex didn't know what lived in boys like Blake. Beautiful boys who should be happy, who wanted for nothing but still found things to take. When night fell, she climbed down from her bunk and pulled on a sweater and jeans. Come to dinner, she begged Mercy, squatting by their beds to turn on a lamp. Mercy's face was puffy from crying. Her hair gleamed in a black slash against the pillow. She had the same thick, dark, impossible-to-curl hair as Alex. I'm not hungry. Mercy, you have to eat. Mercy buried her face in her pillow. I can't. Mercy. Alex shook her shoulder. Mercy, you're not dropping out of school over this. I never said I was. You don't have to say it. I know you're thinking it. You don't understand. I do, said Alex. I had something like this happen to me back in California. When I was younger. And it all blew over? No, it sucked. And I kind of let it wreck my life. You seem all right. I'm not. But I feel all right when I'm here with you and Lauren, so no one gets to take that away. Mercy wiped her hand across her nose. 
So this is all about you? Alex smiled. Exactly. If anyone says anything, if anyone even looks at you wrong, I'll take his eye out with a fork. Mercy put on jeans and a high-necked sweater to cover her hickeys, the outfit so restrained she almost looked like a stranger. She splashed water on her face and dabbed concealer under her eyes. She still looked pale and her eyes were red, but no one looked great on a Sunday night in the dead of a New Haven winter. Alex and Lauren bracketed her, looping their arms through hers as they entered the dining hall. It was noisy as always, filled with the clink of dishes and the warm rise and fall of conversation, but there were no hiccups in the tide of sound as they entered. Maybe, just maybe, Mike and Manuscript had succeeded. They were seated with their trays, Mercy pushing listlessly at her fried cod as Alex guiltily bit into her second cheeseburger, when the laughter started. It was a particular kind of laughter Alex recognized, sneering, too bright, cut short by a hand placed to a mouth in false embarrassment. Lauren went utterly still. Mercy shrank deep into the neck of her sweater, her whole body shaking. Alex tensed, waiting. Let's get out of here, said Lauren. But Evan Wiley swooped down into the seat beside her. Oh my God, I am dying. It's okay, Lauren said to Mercy, and then muttered angrily, What is your problem? I knew Blake was gross, but I didn't know he was that gross. Lauren's phone buzzed, then Alex's. But no one was looking at Mercy, people were just shrieking and gagging at their tables, faces glued to their own screens. Just look, said Mercy, her face in her hands. Tell me. Lauren took a deep breath and picked up her phone. She frowned. Gross, she gasped. I know, said Evan. There on the screen was Blake Keeley, bent over a filthy toilet. Alex felt the snake inside her unwind, warm and gratified, as if it had found the perfect sunbaked rock to warm its belly. Are you serious? Blake said, giggling in exactly the same wild, high-pitched way he had when he'd said, Look at all that bush. Okay, okay, he went on in the video. You're so crazy. But whoever he was talking to couldn't be seen. No, said Lauren. Oh my God, said Mercy. I know, repeated Evan. And as they watched, Blake Keeley dipped his cupped hand into the clogged toilet, scooped up a handful of shit, and took a big bite. He chewed and swallowed, still giggling, and then, Brown smearing his even white teeth and caking his lips, Blake looked at whoever was holding the camera and gave his famous, lazy, shit-eating smile. Alex's phone buzzed again. Awolowo. WTF is wrong with you. Alex kept her reply simple, XOXOXO. You had no right. I trusted you. We all make mistakes. Mike wasn't going to complain to Sando. He'd have to explain that his delegation had somehow let the secret to Maridi slip free and that he'd handed Alex a dose of star power. Alex had used Blake's own phone to send the new video to all of his contacts, and no one at Omega knew her name. Alex, whispered Lauren. What is this? Around them, the dining hall had exploded into pockets of heated conversation, people cackling and pushing their food away in disgust, others demanding to know what was happening. Evan had already moved on to the next table. But Lauren and Mercy were staring at Alex, quiet, their phones placed face down on the table. How did you do it? asked Lauren. Do what? You said you would fix it, Mercy said. She tapped her phone. So? So, said Alex. The silence eddied around them for a long moment. Then Mercy dragged her finger over the table and said, You know how people say two wrongs don't make a right? Yeah. Mercy pulled Alex's plate toward her and took a huge bite of her remaining cheeseburger. They're full of shit. 17. Winter. Alex had spent the rest of Sunday night in the common room with Mercy and Lauren, 
Rimsky-Korsakov on Lauren's turntable, and a copy of The Good Soldier in her lap. The dorm seemed particularly raucous that night, and there were repeated knocks at the sweet door, all of which they ignored. Eventually, Anna came home looking glum and somnolent as ever. She gave them a flat hey and vanished into her bedroom. A minute later, they heard her on the phone to her family in Texas and had to cover their mouths, shoulders heaving and tears squeezing from their eyes when they heard her say, I'm pretty sure they're witches. If you only knew. Alex slept dreamlessly, but woke in the night to find the bridegroom hovering outside her bedroom window, the wards keeping him at bay. His face was expectant. Tomorrow, she promised. Less than twenty-four hours had passed since her journey to the borderlands. She would get to Terra, but Mercy had needed her first. She owed more to the living than to the dead. I'm handling this, she thought, as she downed two more aspirin and fell back into bed. Maybe not the way Darlington would have, but I'm managing. Her first stop on Monday morning was I.L. Bastone, to pack her pockets with graveyard dirt and to spend an hour skimming the information she could find on Gloomy. If Book and Snake, or whoever had sent that thing after her, wanted to try again, this was the perfect time to do it. She'd freaked out in public, she was under the gun academically. If she suddenly threw herself in a river or off a building or into traffic, there would be plenty of warning signs to point to. Did she seem depressed? She was distant. She didn't make many friends. She was struggling in her classes. All true. But would it have mattered if she'd been someone else? If she'd been a social butterfly, they would have said she liked to drink away her pain. If she'd been a straight-A student, they would have said she'd been eaten alive by her perfectionism. There were always excuses for why girls died. And yet Alex was weirdly comforted by how different her story would be now from what it might have been a year ago. Dying of hypothermia after getting wasted and breaking into a public pool. Overdosing when she tried something new or went too far. Or just vanishing. Losing lens protection and disappearing into the long sprawl of the San Fernando Valley, the rows of little houses like stucco mausoleums in their tiny plots. But if she could avoid dying right now, that would be nice. It's the principle of the thing, as Darlington would say. After arguing with the library for a few hours, she found two passages on how to combat gloomy, one in English, one in Hebrew, which required a translation stone and turned out to be less about gloomy than golems. But since both sources mentioned the use of a wrist or pocket watch, the advice seemed sound. Wind your timepiece tight. The steady tick of a watch confuses any creature made, not born. They perceive a heartbeat in simple clockwork and will look to find a body where there is none. It wasn't exactly protection, but distraction would have to do. Darlington had worn a wristwatch with a wide black leather band and mother-of-pearl face. She'd assumed it was an heirloom or affectation. But maybe it had a purpose, too. Alex entered the armory, where they kept Hiram's crucible. The golden bull looked almost bereft for lack of use. She found a pocket watch tangled up in a drawer with a collection of pendulums used for hypnotism, wound it, and tucked it into her pocket. But she had to open a lot of drawers before she found the mirrored compact she wanted, wrapped in cotton batting. A card in the drawer explained the mirror's provenance, the glass originally fashioned in China, then set into the compact by members of manuscript for a still-classified Cold War op run by the CIA. How it had made its way from Langley to the Lethe Mansion on Orange, the card didn't. Say. The glass was smudged, and Alex wiped it clean with a puff of breath and her sweatshirt. Despite the events of the weekend, she made it through Spanish without her usual sense of blurriness or panic, spent two hours in Sterling powering through the last of her reading for her Shakespeare section, and then ate her usual double-serving lunch. She felt awake, focused the way she was on Basso Belladonna, but without the heart-twitching jitters. And to think, all it had taken was an attempt on her life and a visit to the borderlands of hell. 
if only she'd known sooner. That morning, North had been hovering in the Vanderbilt courtyard, and she'd muttered that she wouldn't be free until after lunch. Sure enough, he was waiting when she emerged from the dining hall, and they set out together up college to prospect. They were nearly to Ingalls' rink when she realized she hadn't seen a single gray. No, that wasn't quite true. She saw them behind columns, darting into alleys. They're afraid of him, she realized. She remembered him standing in the river, smiling. There are worse things than death, Miss Stern. Alex had to keep consulting her phone as she cut down to Mansfield. She still couldn't quite hold the map of New Haven in her head. She knew the main arteries of the Yale campus, the routes she walked each week to class, but the rest of the body was vague and shapeless to her. She was headed toward a neighborhood she'd driven with Darlington once in his old battered Mercedes. He'd shown her the old Winchester repeating arms factory, which had been partially turned into fancy lofts, the line running straight down the building where the paint gave way to raw brick, the exact moment when the developer had run out of money. He gestured to the sad grid of Science Park, Yale's bid for medical tech investment in the 90s. I guess it didn't work, Alex had said, noting the boarded-up windows and empty parking lot. In the words of my grandfather, this town has been fucked from the start. Darlington had leaned on the gas, as if Alex had witnessed some embarrassing family spat at the Thanksgiving table. They'd passed the cheap row houses and apartment buildings where workmen had lived during the Winchester days. Then, farther up the slope of Science Hill, the homes that had belonged to the company's foreman, their houses built of brick instead of wood, their lawns wider and trimmed by hedges. Up the hill, farther and farther, solid homes giving way to grand mansions and, at last, the imposing, wooded sprawl of the Marsh Botanical Garden, as if a spell had been lifted. But today, Alex wouldn't go to the top of the hill. She kept to the shallows, the weathered row houses, barren yards, liquor stores notched into the corners. Detective Turner had said Tara lived on woodland, and even without the uniform posted at the door, Alex would have had no trouble picking out the dead girl's place. Across the street, a woman leaned against the fence bordering her yard, arms draped over the chain links as if caught in a slow-motion dive, gazing at the ugly apartment building as if it might start speaking. Two guys in tracksuits stood talking on the sidewalk, their bodies turned toward the scrubby front lawn of Tara's building but keeping a coy distance. Alex couldn't blame them. Trouble had a way of catching. Most cities are palimpsests, Darlington had once told her. When she'd searched for the word's meaning, it had taken her three starts to find the right spelling. Built over and over again, so you can't remember what went where. But New Haven wears its scars. The big highways that run the wrong way, the dead office parks, the vistas that stretch into nothing but power lines. No one realizes how much life happens between the wounds, how much it has to offer. It's a city built to make you want to keep driving away from it. Tara had lived in the ridges of one of those scars. Alex hadn't worn her peacoat, hadn't pulled her hair back. It was easy for her to fit in here, and she didn't want to draw notice. She set a slow pace, stopped well down the block as if waiting for someone, checked her phone, glanced at North just long enough to detect his frustrated expression. Relax, she muttered. I don't answer to you, buddy. At least I don't think I do. At last a man exited Tara's building. He was tall, thin, wearing a patriot's jacket and light-washed jeans. He nodded a hello to the officer and popped his headphones in as he made his way down the brick steps. Alex trailed him around the corner. When they were out of view, she tapped him on the shoulder. He turned and she held up the mirror in her hand. It flashed bright. Sunlight over his face and he threw his hand up to block the glare, stepping back. What the hell? Alex snapped the mirror shut. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, she said. I thought you were Tom Brady. The guy shot her an ugly look and strode off. 
Alex jogged back to the apartment building. When she approached the officer at the door, she held up the mirror like a badge. The light fell on his face. Back already? asked the cop, seeing nothing but the captured image of the guy in the Patriot's jacket. Manuscript might have the worst tomb, but they had some of the best tricks. Forgot my wallet, Alex said, making her voice as gruff as possible. The cop nodded, and she vanished inside the front door. Alex pocketed the mirror and headed down the hall, moving quickly. She found Tara's apartment on the second floor, the threshold marked by police tape. Alex thought she might have to pick the lock, she'd had to learn the basics after her mom had gone all tough love and barred her from the apartment. There had been something eerie about breaking into her own home, slipping inside like she was herself a phantom, standing in a space that might have belonged to anyone. But the lock on Tara's door was missing entirely. It looked like the cops had removed it. Alex nudged the door forward and ducked beneath the tape. It was clear no one had been back to try to straighten up Tara's apartment after the police had been through it. Who would? One of its occupants was in police custody, the other dead on a slab. Drawers were pulled open, cushions removed from the couches, some cut open by the police looking for contraband. The floor was littered with debris, a framed poster that had been yanked out of its frame a discarded golf club, makeup brushes. Even so, Alex could see Tara had tried to make it a nice place to live. There were colorful quilts pinned to the walls, all purples and blues. Calming colors, Alex's mom would have said. Oceanic. A dream catcher hung in the window above a collection of succulents. Alex picked up one of the small pots, touching her fingers to the fat waxy leaves of the plant inside. She'd bought one almost exactly like it at a farmer's market. They required almost no care or water. Little survivors. She knew her plant had probably been thrown into the garbage or bagged as evidence, but she liked to think of it still sitting on the windowsill at ground zero, gathering sun. Alex walked down the narrow hall to the bedroom. It was in a similar state of disarray. A heap of pillows and stuffed animals lay by the bed. The back of the dresser had been taken apart. From the window, Alex could just make out the peaked tower of the old Marsh Mansion. It was part of the forestry school, its long, sloping backyard full of greenhouses, and all just a few minutes' walk from Tara's place. What did you get up to, girl? North had paused in the hall by the bathroom, hovering. Something with. Effluvia, he'd told her. The bathroom was long and skinny, with little room to move between the standing sink and the battered shower tub combination. Alex eyed the items on the sink, in the wastebasket. A toothbrush where used tissues weren't going to do it. North had said the item should be personal. Alex opened the medicine cabinet. There was barely anything left inside, but perched on the top shelf was a blue plastic box. A sticker on the lid read, Change your smile, change your life. Alex popped it open. Tara's retainer. North looked skeptical. Do you even know what this is? Alex asked. Do you know you're looking at the miracle of modern orthodonture? He crossed his arms. Didn't think so. North was a century and a half short of getting it, but most of the kids on campus probably wouldn't have given it a second thought either. A retainer was the kind of thing people's parents bought them, that kids never knew the cost of, that got lost on school trips or forgotten in a drawer. But for Tara this was important. Something she would have saved for months to get, that she would have worn every night and would have taken care not to lose. Change your smile change your life. Alex tore off a piece of toilet paper and plucked the retainer from the case. It mattered to her. Trust me. And hopefully still had some quality effluvia on it. Alex stoppered the sink and filled it. Would this count as a body of water? She hoped so. She dropped the retainer into the water. 
Before it could sink to the bottom, she saw a pale hand emerge beside the drain, as if it had bloomed from the cracked basin. As soon as the fingers closed, both hand and retainer vanished. When she looked up, North held it in his dripping palm, his mouth curled in distaste. Alex shrugged. You wanted effluvia. She pushed the stopper down, dropped the tissue in the basket, and turned to go. A man was standing in the doorway. He was huge, his head nearly brushing the frame, his shoulders filling the space. He wore a mechanic's gray coverall, the top unzipped and hanging loose. His white t-shirt revealed muscled arms covered in ink. I, Alex began. But he was already charging. He barreled into her, slamming her backward against the wall. Her head cracked against the window ledge and he grabbed her by the throat. She clawed at his arms. North's eyes had gone black. He threw himself at her attacker but passed right through him. This was not a gluma. Not a ghost. This wasn't something from beyond the veil. He was flesh and blood and trying to kill her. North couldn't help her now. Alex slammed her palm into his throat. His breath caught on a gulp and his grip loosened. She brought her knee up between his legs. Not a direct hit, but close enough. He doubled over. Alex shoved past him, tearing the shower curtain off its rings as she passed, stumbling over the plastic. She hurtled into the hallway, north on her heels, and was reaching for the door when suddenly the mechanic was in front of her. He hadn't opened the door, he'd simply appeared through it. Just like a gray mite. Portal magic? For the briefest moment Alex glimpsed what looked like a barren yard behind him, then he was striding toward her. She backed up through the cluttered living room, wrapping an arm around her middle, trying to think. She was bleeding, and it hurt to breathe. He'd broken her ribs. She wasn't sure how many. She could feel something warm and wet trickling down the back of her neck from where she'd hit her head. Could she make it to the kitchen? Grab a knife? Who are you? The mechanic growled. His voice was low and raspy, maybe from Alex's chop to his windpipe. Who hurt Tara? Her shitbag boyfriend, Alex spat. He roared and rushed at her. Alex lurched left toward the mantel, dodging him narrowly but he was still between her and the door, bouncing on his heels, as if this were some kind of boxing match. He smiled. Nowhere to run, bitch. Before she could slip past him, he had his hands around her throat again. Black spots filled her vision. North was shouting, gesturing wildly, powerless to help. No, not powerless. That wasn't right. Let me in, Alex. No one knew who she was. Not North. Not this monster in front of her. Not Dawes or Mercy or Sando or any of them. Only Darlington had guessed. 18. Last fall. Darlington knew Alex resented the call. He could hardly blame her. It wasn't a Thursday, when rituals took place, or a Sunday, when she was expected to prepare for the next week's work and he knew she was struggling to keep up with her classes and the demands of Lethe. He'd been concerned about how the incident at Manuscript might impact their work, but she'd shrugged it off more easily than he had, handling the report so that he wouldn't have to relive the embarrassment and going right back to complaining about Lethe's demands. The ease with which she let go of that night, the casual forgiveness she'd offered, unnerved him and made him wonder again at the grim march of the life she'd lived before. She'd even made it smoothly through her second rite with Aurelian, a patent application at the Peabody's ugly, fluorescent-lit satellite campus, and her first prognostication for skull and bones. There'd been a rocky moment when she turned distinctly green and looked like she might vomit all over the hair specks. But she'd managed, and he could hardly fault her for wavering. He'd been through twelve prognostications and they still left him feeling shaken. It will be quick, stern, he promised her as they set out from Islebastone on Tuesday night. Rosenfeld is causing trouble with the grid. 
Who's Rosenfeld? It's a what? Rosenfeld Hall. You should know the rest. She adjusted the strap on her satchel. I don't remember. Saint Elmo, he prompted her. Right. The electrocuted guy. He'd give her the point. Saint Erasmus had supposedly survived electrocution and drowning. He was the namesake for Saint Elmo's fire and for the society that had once been housed in Rosenfeld Hall's Elizabethan Towers. The red brick building was used for offices and annex space now and was locked at night, but Darlington had a key. Put these on, he said, handing her rubber gloves and rubber overboots, not unlike the kind once made in his family's factory. Alex obliged and followed him into the foyer. Why couldn't this wait until tomorrow? Because the last time Lethe let trouble at Rosenfeld go, we had a campus wide blackout. As if chiming in, the lights in the upper stories flickered. The building hummed softly. This is all in the life of Lethe. Remember how you said we don't concern ourselves with the non landed societies? Alex asked. I do, said Darlington, though he knew what was coming. I took your teachings to heart. Darlington sighed and used his key to open another door, this one to a huge storage room packed with battered dorm furniture and discarded mattresses. This is the old dining hall of St. Elmo. He shone his flashlight over the soaring Gothic arches and cunning stone details. When the society was cash poor in the sixties, the university purchased the building from them and promised to keep leasing the crypt rooms to St. Elmo to use for their rituals. But instead of a proper contract built by Aurelian to secure the terms, the parties opted for a gentleman's agreement. Did the gentlemen change their minds? They died, and less gentlemen took over. Yale refused to renew the society's lease and St. Elmo's ended up in that grubby little house on Linwood. Home is where the heart is, you snob. Precisely, stern. And the heart of St. Elmo was here, in their original tomb. They've been broke and all but magicless since they lost this place. Help me move these. They shoved two old bed frames out of the way, revealing another locked door. The society had been known for weather magic, Artium Tempe State which they had used for everything from manipulating commodities to swaying the outcome of essential field goals. Since the move to Linwood they hadn't managed so much as a swift breeze. All of the society's houses were built at nexuses of magical power. No one was sure what created them, but it was why new tombs couldn't simply be built. There were places in this world that magic avoided, like the bleak lunar plains of the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and places it was drawn to, like Rockefeller Center in Manhattan and the French Quarter in New Orleans. New Haven had an extremely high concentration of sites where magic seemed to catch and build, like cotton candy on a spool. The staircase they were descending wound down through three subterranean floors, the hum growing louder with every downward step. There was little left to actually see in the lower levels, the dusty stuffed bodies of retired New Haven Zoo animals, acquired on a lark by J. P. Morgan in his wilder days, old electrical conductors with pointed metal spires, straight out of a classic monster movie, empty vats and cracked glass tanks. Aquariums, asked Alex. Teapots for tempests. This was where the students of St. Elmo had brewed weather. Blizzards that raised utility prices, droughts that burned away crops, winds high and strong enough to sink a battleship. The hum was louder here, a relentless electrical moan that raised the hair on Darlington's arms and reverberated over his teeth. What is that? Alex asked over the noise, pressing her hands to her ears. Darlington knew from experience that would do no good. The hum was in the floor, in the air. Stay in it long enough, and you'd start to go mad. St. Elmo spent years here, summoning storms. For some reason the weather likes to return. And when it does, we get the call? He led her back to the old fuse box. It was long since out of use, but mostly free of dust. 
Darlington took the silver weather vane from his bag. Hold out your hand, he said. He set it in Alex's palm. Breathe on it. Alex gave him a skeptical look, then huffed a breath over the spindly silver arms. It shot upright like a sleepwalker in a cartoon. Again, he instructed. The weather vane turned slowly, catching the wind, then began to work in Alex's palm as if caught in a gale. She leaned back slightly. In the beam of his flashlight, her hair rose around her head, a halo of wind and electricity that made her look as if her face were wreathed in dark snakes. He remembered her at the manuscript party, shrouded in night, and had to blink twice to shake the image from his mind. It wasn't the first time the memory had come back to him, and he was always left uneasy, unsure of whether it was the shame of that night that lingered or if he'd seen something real, something he should have had the sense to look away from. Set the vein spinning, he instructed then hit the switches. He flipped them in rapid succession, all the way down the line. And always. Wear gloves. He'd known. The first day he met her, he'd known there was something wrong with her, but he never could have guessed the depth of it. Murderer. But who had she killed, really? No one who would be missed. Maybe she'd done what she had to. Either way, the Lethe board had no idea who they were dealing with, what they'd brought into the fold. What are you going to do? Alex asked. Those hard black eyes, stones in the river. No remorse, no excuses. Her only drive was survival. I don't know, said Darlington, but they both knew that was a lie. He would have to tell Dean Sando. There was no way around it. Ask her why. No, ask her how. Her motive should matter more to him, but Darlington knew it was the how that would obsess him, and probably the board as well. But they could never let her continue at Lethe. If something happened, if Alex hurt someone again, they would be liable. We'll see, he said, and turned toward the deep shadow in the corner. He didn't want to keep looking at her, to see the fear in her face, the knowledge of all she was about to lose. Was she ever really going to make it anyway? A cold part said she'd never really had what it took to be Lethe. To be Yale. This girl of the West, of easy sunshine, plywood, and formica. Someone was here before us, he said, because it was easier to talk about the work in front of them rather than the fact that she was a killer. Leonard Beacon had been beaten unrecognizable. Mitchell Betts's organs had been nearly liquefied, pummeled into pulp. Two men in the back rooms had holes in their chests that indicated they'd been staked in the heart. The bat had been left in fragments so small it had been impossible to lift fingerprints. But Alex had been clean. No blood on her. The crime techs had even checked the drains. Darlington gestured to the dark blot in the corner. Someone opened a portal. Okay, she said. Cautious, unsure. The camaraderie and ease they'd earned over the last months gone like passing weather. I'll ward it, he said. We'll go back to Isle Bastion and talk this out. Did he mean that, he wondered? Or did he mean, I'll learn what I can before I turn you in and you go quiet? Tonight, she'd still be looking to barter, a trait of information for his silence. She was his Dante. That should matter. She's a killer. And a liar. This isn't something I can keep from Sando. Okay, she said again. Darlington drew two magnets from his pocket and traced a clean sign of warding over the portal. Doorways like this were strictly scroll and key magic, but it was a ridiculous risk for the locksmiths to try to open a portal away from their tomb. Nevertheless, it was their own magic he would use to close it. Allsumed, he began. Muckle, the breath was sucked from his mouth before he could finish the words. Something had hold of him, and Darlington knew he'd made a terrible mistake. This was not a portal. Not at all. He realized in that last moment 
how few things he had to tether him to the world. What could keep him here? Who knew him well enough to keep hold of his heart? All of the books and the music and the art and the history, the silent stones of Black Elm, the streets of this town. This town. None of it would remember him. He tried to speak. A warning? The last gasp of a know-it-all? Here lies the boy with all the answers. Except there would be no grave. Danny was looking at Alex's old young face, at her dark well eyes, at the lips that remained parted, that did not move to speak. She did not step forward. She cast no words of protection. He ended as he had always suspected he would, alone in the dark. 19. Last Summer Alex couldn't trace where the trouble began at Ground Zero that night. It all went too far back. Len had been trying to move up, to get Aton to let him take on more weight. We'd paid the bills, but the private school kids at Buckley and Oakwood wanted Adderall, Molly, Oxy, Ketamine, and Aton just didn't trust Len with more than dime bags of green, no matter how much he kissed up. Len loved to bitch about Aton, called him an oily Jewish prick and Alex would squirm, thinking of her grandmother lighting the prayer candles on Shabbat. But Aton Schaffer had everything Len wanted, money, cars, a seemingly endless line of aspiring models on his arm. He lived in a mega mansion in Encino with an infinity pool that overlooked the 405 freeway surrounded by a crazy amount of muscle. The problem was that Len didn't have anything Aton wanted until Ariel came to town. Ariel, Heli had said. That's an angel's name. Ariel was Aton's cousin or brother or something. Alex was never sure. He had wide-set eyes with heavy lids, a handsome face framed by perfectly groomed stubble. He made Alex nervous from moment one. He was too still, like a creature hunting, and she could sense the violence in him waiting. She saw it in the way even Aton deferred to him the way the parties at the house in Encino grew more frantic, desperate to impress him, to keep him entertained, as if boring Ariel might be a very dangerous thing. Alex had the sense that Ariel, or some version of him, had always been there, that the messy clockwork of men like Aiton and Len could not operate without someone like Ariel looming above it all, leaning back in his seat, his slow blink like a countdown. Ariel got a kick out of Len. Len made him laugh, though somehow Ariel never seemed to smile when he was laughing. He loved to wave Len over to his table. He'd slap him on the back and get him to freestyle. This is our inn, Len said the day Ariel invited himself to ground zero. Alex couldn't understand how Len didn't see that Ariel was laughing at him, that he was amused by their poverty, excited by their want. The survivor in her understood that there were men who liked to see other people grovel, liked to push to see what humiliations the needs of others would allow. There were rumors floating around Aton's place, passed from one girl to the next, don't end up alone with Ariel. He doesn't just like it rough, he likes it ugly. Alex had tried to make Lynn see the danger. Don't mess around with this guy, she'd told him. He's not like us but he likes me. He just likes playing with his food. He's getting Aton to level me up, Len said, standing at the chipped yellow counter at ground zero. Why do you have to shit on anything good that happens to me? It's garbage can fentanyl, for fuck's sake. He's giving it to you because no one wants it. Aton didn't mess with fentanyl unless he knew exactly where it had come from. He liked to stay off law enforcement radar and killing your clients tended to draw attention. Someone had paid off a debt to him in what was supposed to be heroin cut with fentanyl, but it had passed through too many hands to be considered clean. Don't screw this up for me, Alex, Len said. Make this shithole look nice. Let me get my magic wand. He'd slapped her then, but not hard. Just an I mean business slap. Hey, hell I had protested. Alex was never sure what hell I intended. When she said, hey, but she was grateful for it anyway. 
Relax, Lin said. Ariel wants to party with real people, not those plastic assholes Aton heaps around. We're going to go get Damon's speakers. Get everything cleaned up. He'd looked at Hell Lai, then at Alex. Try to look nice. No attitude tonight. Let's go, Alex had said as soon as Len left the apartment, Betya in the passenger seat, already lighting up. Betya's real name was Mitchell, but Alex hadn't known that until he got picked up on a possession charge and they had to scrape together bail. He'd run with Len since long before Alex and was always just there, tall, stocky, and soft-bellied, his chin perpetually flecked with acne. Alex and Helai started walking, heading toward the concrete bed of the L.A. River, then up to the bus stop on Sherman Way, with no destination in mind. They'd done it before, even sworn they were leaving for good, gotten as far as the Santa Monica Pier, Barstow, once all the way to Vegas, where they'd spent the first day wandering hotel lobbies and the second day stealing quarters from old ladies playing the slots until they had enough for bus fare home. Speeding down the 15 in the air conditioning on the way back to L.A., they'd fallen asleep leaning on each other's shoulders. Alex had dreamed of the garden at the Bellagio, the water wheels and piped in perfume, the flowers arranged like a jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes it took Alex and Hell lie hours, sometimes days, but they always came back. There was too much world. There were too many choices, and those only seemed to lead to more choices. That was the business of living, and neither of them had ever acquired the skill. Lynn says we're going to lose ground zero if Ariel doesn't come through, Helai said, as they boarded the RTD. No grand plans today. No Vegas, just a trip to the west side. It's talk, said Alex. He's going to be pissed we didn't clean up. Alex looked out the murky window and said, You notice Aton sent his girlfriend away? What? When Ariel came to town. He's sending her away. He hasn't had any of the usual girls around. Only Valley Trash. It's not that big a deal, Alex. They both knew what Ariel was coming to Ground Zero for. He wanted to slum it for a while and Alex and Helai were supposed to be part of the fun. It never feels like a big deal until it is, Alex said. There had been other favors. The first time was a film guy, or at least someone Len said was a film guy, who was going to get them lots of Hollywood business, but Alex learned later he was just a production assistant, straight out of film school. She'd ended up sitting on his lap all night, hoping that might be all there was to it, until he'd taken her back to the little bathroom and put their filthy bath mat down on the tiles, a weirdly chivalrous gesture so that she could blow him in greater comfort while he sat on the toilet. I'm fifteen, she thought as she'd rinsed out her mouth and cleaned up her eye makeup. What does fifteen look like? Was another Alex going to slumber parties and kissing boys at school dances? Could she climb through the mirror above the sink and slide into that girl's skin? But she was fine. Really okay. Until the next morning. When Len kept slamming cabinet doors and smoking in this way he had where it seemed like he wanted to eat the cigarette with every drag, until at last Alex had snapped and said, What is your problem? My problem? My girlfriend is a whore. Alex had heard that word so many times from Len it barely registered anymore. Bitch, slut, occasionally cunt when he was feeling particularly angry or when he was affecting British gangster but he'd never called her that. That was a word for other girls. You said. I didn't say shit. You told me to make him happy. And that means suck his dick and whore? Alex's head had done a dizzy spin. How did he know? Had the film guy walked right out of that bathroom and just announced it? And even if he had, why was Lynn angry? She knew what make him happy meant. Alex had felt nothing but rage and it was better than any drug, burning doubt from her mind. What the fuck did you think I was going to do, she demanded, surprised at how loud she sounded, how sure. Impressions? 
make him some balloon animals? She'd picked up their blender, the one Len used for protein shakes, and smashed it against the refrigerator, and for a moment she'd seen fear in Len's eyes and she had wanted very badly to keep making him feel afraid. Len had called her crazy, slammed out of the apartment. He had run from her. But once he was gone, the adrenaline had poured out of Alex in a rush. That left her feeling limp and lonely. She didn't feel angry or righteous, just ashamed and so scared that somehow she'd ruined everything, ruined herself, that Len would never want her again. And then where would she go? All she'd wanted was for him to come back. In the end she apologized and begged him to forgive her, and they got high and turned the air conditioning up and fucked right next to it, the air coming in cooling gusts that masked their panting. But when Len had said she was a good little slut, she hadn't felt sexy or wild, she'd felt so small. She was afraid she might cry, and she was afraid he might like that too. She'd turned her face to the vent, and felt the icy breath of the AC unit blow the fine hairs back from her face. She squeezed her eyes shut, and as Len had jackrabbit away behind her, she'd imagined herself on a glacier, naked and alone, the world clean and empty and full of forgiveness. But Ariel wasn't a film student looking for some strange. He had a reputation. There were stories that he was only in the States because he was dodging the Israeli police after roughing up two underage girls in Tel Aviv, that he ran a dogfighting ring, that he liked to dislocate girls' shoulders as a kind of foreplay, like a boy pulling the wings off a fly. Len would be furious when he returned home to find the apartment still a mess. He'd be even madder when they didn't come back to Ground Zero for the party but they could survive Len's anger better than Ariel's attention. Alex understood that Len had expected some kind of jealousy when he'd brought Heli home with them that day from Venice Beach. He hadn't predicted Heli's warm laugh, her easy way of looping her arm around Alex, the way she'd pluck a paperback from Alex's shelf of thrillers and old sci-fi and say, Read to me. Heli had made this life bearable. Alex wasn't going down the path that led to Ariel, and she wasn't going to let Heli go either, because somehow she knew they would not come back from him intact. They didn't have a great life. It wasn't the kind of life anyone imagined or asked for, but they managed. They took the bus over the hill, down the 101 to the 405 to Westwood, and walked all the way to UCLA, up the slope to campus and through the sculpture garden. They sat on the steps beneath the pretty arches of Royce Hall and watched the students playing frisbee and lying in the sun reading. Leisure These golden people pursued leisure because they had so many things they had to do. Occupations Goals Alex had nothing she needed to do. Ever. It made her feel like she was falling. When it got bad, she liked talking about the two-year game plan. She and Heli would start community college in the fall, or they'd take online classes. They'd both get jobs at the mall and put their money toward a used car so they wouldn't have to take the bus everywhere. Usually Heli liked to play along, but not that day. She'd been sullen, cranky, poking holes in everything. No one is going to give us enough shifts at the mall to afford a car and rent. Then we'll be secretaries for something. Heli had cast a long look over Alex's arms. Too many tattoos. Not on Heli. Lying there on the steps of Royce in her jean shorts, her golden legs crossed, she looked like she belonged. I like that you think this is really happening. It's cute. It could happen. We can't lose the apartment, Alex. I was homeless for a while after my mom kicked me out. I'm not doing that again. You won't have to. Len's just talking. Even if he's not, we'll figure it out. If you stay in the sun much longer, you're gonna look all Mexicana. Heli rose and dusted off her shorts. Let's smoke and go see a movie. We won't have enough money for the bus back. Heli winked. We'll figure it out. They'd found a movie theater, the old Fox, 
where Alex sometimes saw the staff putting up red ropes for premieres. Alex had nestled against Helly's shoulder, smelling the sweet coconut scent of her still sun-warm skin, feeling the silk of her blonde hair brushing occasionally against her forehead. Eventually she dozed off, and when the theater lights came up, Helly was gone. Alex had gone out into the lobby, then the bathroom, then texted Helly, and it was only after the second text that she finally got a reply, it's okay. I figured it out. Helly had gone back for the party. She'd gone back to Len and Ariel. She'd made sure Alex wouldn't be there in time to stop her. Alex had no money left, no way to get to home. She tried hitching, but no one wanted to pick up a girl with tears streaming down her face, dressed in a dirty t-shirt and the nubs of black jean shorts. She'd walked up and down Westwood Boulevard, unsure of what to do, until at last she'd sold the last of her pot to a redhead with dreads and a skinny dog. When she got back to the apartment, her feet were bloody where blisters had formed and burst inside her Converse low tops. The party was in full swing at ground zero, the music filtering outside in thuds and chirps. She crept inside but didn't see Helly or Ariel in the living room. She waited in line for the bathroom, hoping no one would report her presence to Len or that he'd be too wasted to care, washed her feet in the tub, then went to the back bedroom and lay down on the mattress. She texted Helly again. Are you here? I'm in the back. Hell lie, please. Please. She'd fallen asleep, but woke to the sound of Hell lie lying down beside her. In the dim shine of the security light from the alley, she looked yellow all over. Her eyes were huge and glassy. Are you okay? Alex had asked. Was it bad? No, Hell lie said, but Alex didn't know which question Hell lie was answering. No, no, no. No, no. Helly wrapped her arms around Alex and drew her close. Her hair was damp. She had showered. She smelled like dial soap, devoid of the usual sweet coconut Helly smell. No, 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 she kept saying. She was giggling, her body shaking in the way it did when she was trying to keep from laughing too loudly, but her hands clutched Alex's back the fingers digging in as if she were being pulled out to sea. Hours later, Alex had woken again. She felt as if she'd never have a real night's sleep or a real morning, just these short naps broken by half-waking. It was 3 a.m., and the party had died down or moved elsewhere. The apartment was quiet. Helly was on her side, looking at her. Her eyes still looked wild. She'd vomited on her shirt at some point in the night. Alex wrinkled her nose at the stink. Good morning, smelly Helly, she said. Helly smiled, and there was such sweetness in her face, such sadness. Let's get the fuck out of here, Alex said. For good. We're done with this place. Helly nodded. Take that shirt off. You smell like hot lunch, Alex said and reached for the hem. Her hand passed straight through it, straight through the place where the firm skin of Helly's abdomen should have been. Helly blinked once, those eyes so sad, so sad. She just lay there, still looking at Alex, studying her, Alex realized, for the last time. Helly was gone. But she wasn't. Her body was lying on the mattress, on her back, a foot away, her tight t-shirt splattered with vomit, still and cold. Her skin was blue. How long had her ghost lain there waiting for Alex to wake? There were two hellies in the room. There were no hellies in the room. Helly. Helly. Helen. Alex was crying, leaning over her body, feeling for a pulse. Something broke inside her. Come back, she sobbed reaching for Helly's ghost, her arms passing through her again and again. With each swipe she glimpsed a bright shard of Helly's life. Her parents' sunny house in Carpinteria. Her calloused feet on a surfboard. Ariel with his fingers jammed into her mouth. 
you didn't have to do it. You didn't have to. But Helli said nothing, just wept silently. The tears looked like silver against her cheeks. Alex started screaming. Lynn slammed through the door, his shirt untucked, his hair a messy tangle, already swearing that it was three in the morning and couldn't he get some rest in his own house, when he saw Helly's body. Then he was saying the same thing over and over again. Fuck fuck fuck. Just like Helly's no no no. rat tat tat A moment later he had his palm pressed against Alex's mouth. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. God, you stupid bitch, be quiet. But Alex couldn't be quiet. She sobbed in loud torrents, her chest heaving as he squeezed her tighter and tighter. She couldn't breathe. Snot was running from her nose, and his hand was clamped tight against her lips. She scrabbled against him as he squeezed. She was going to black out. Jesus fuck. He shoved her away, wiped his hands on his pants. Just shut up and let me think. Oh shit. Betya was in the doorway, his big belly hanging over his basketball shorts, his t-shirt gapping. Is she? We've got to clean her up, said Lynn, get her out of here. For a moment, Alex was nodding, thinking he meant to make her look nice. Hell I shouldn't have to go to the hospital with vomit on her shirt. She shouldn't be found that way. It's still early. No one's out there said Lynn. We can get her in the car, drop her. I don't know. That nasty ass club on Havenhurst. Crashers? Yeah, we'll put her in the alley. She looks used up enough, and there's got to be plenty of shit still in her system. Yeah, said Betcha. Okay. Alex watched them, her ears ringing. Hell I was watching them too from her place beside her own body on the mattress, listening to them talk about throwing her out like trash. I'm calling the cops, Alex said. Ariel must have given her. Len hit her, open-handed but hard. Don't be fucking stupid. You want to go to jail? You want Aiton and Ariel coming after us? He hit her again. Shit, man, calm down, said Betcha. Don't be like that. But he wasn't going to step in. He wasn't going to actually do anything to stop Len. Helly's ghost tipped her head back, looked at the ceiling, started drifting toward the wall. Come on, said Len to Betcha. Grab her ankles. You can't do this to her, Alex said. It was what she should have said the previous night. Every night. You can't do this to her. Helly's ghost was already starting to fade through the wall. Lynn and Betcha had her body slung between them like a hammock. Lynn had his arms under Helly's armpits. Her head lolled to the side. God, she smells like shit. Betcha gripped her ankles. One of her pearly pink jelly shoes dangled from her foot. She hadn't taken them off before she came to bed. She probably hadn't noticed. Alex watched it slide off her toe and thunk to the ground. Shit, put that back on her. Betya fumbled awkwardly with it, setting down her feet, then trying to jam the shoe back on like some kind of a footman in Cinderella. Oh for fuck's sake, just bring it with you. We'll throw it in with her. It was only when Alex followed them into the living room that she saw Ariel was still there, asleep on the couch in his undershorts. I'm Triana. Sleep, for shit's sake, he said, blinking drowsily at them. Oh shit, is she? And then he giggled. They paused in front of the door. Len tried to reach for the knob, knocked over his stupid gangster bat that he kept there for protection. But he couldn't balance Helly's body and get the knob to turn. Come on, he snapped. Open the door, Alex. Let us out. Let me in. Helly's ghost hung halfway through the window and the sky. She was fading to gray. Would she trail them all the way down to that grimy alley? Don't go, Alex begged her. 
but Len thought she was talking to him. Open the door, you useless bitch. Alex reached for the knob. Let me in. The metal was cold in her hand. She started to open the door, then shut it. She flipped the lock and turned to face Len and Betya and Ariel. What now? Len said impatiently. Alex held her hand out to hell lie. Stay with me. She didn't know what she was asking. She didn't know what she was offering. But hell lie understood. She felt hell lie rush toward her, felt herself splitting, being torn open to make room for another heart, another pair of lungs, for Helly's will, for Helly's strength. What now, Len? Alex asked. She picked up the bat. Alex didn't remember much of what happened next. The sense of hell lie inside her like a deep, held breath. How light and natural the bat felt in her hand. There was no hesitation. She swung from her left, just as hell lie had when she'd played for the Midway Mustangs. Alex was so strong it made her clumsy. She hit Len first, a hard crack to the skull. He stepped sideways and she stumbled, knocked off balance by the force of her own swing. She hit him again and his head gave way with a thick crunch, like a piñata breaking open, chips of skull and brain flying, blood spattering everywhere. Betya still had Heli's ankles in his hands when Alex turned the bat on him. She was that fast. She struck him behind the knees first, and he screamed as he collapsed, then she brought the bat down like a sledgehammer on his neck and shoulders. Ariel rose and at first she thought he might reach for a gun, but he was backing away, eyes terrified, and as she passed the sliding glass door, she understood why. She was glowing. She chased him to the door, no, not chased. She flew at him as if her feet were barely touching the ground. Helly's rage was like a drug inside her body, setting her blood on fire. She knocked Ariel to the floor and hit him again and again, until the bat broke against his spine. Then she took the two jagged pieces in her hands and went to find the rest of the vampires, a coven of boys, asleep in their beds, wasted and drooling. When it was done, when there were no more people left to kill and she felt her own exhaustion creeping into Heli's limitless energy, Hel Lai was the one who guided her, made her put the pink plastic shoes on her own feet and walk the two miles down to where Roscoe crossed the Los Angeles River. She saw no one along the way, Hel Lai steered her down each empty street, telling her where to turn, when to wait, when it was safe, until they reached the bridge and climbed down in the dawning gray of early morning. They waded in together, the water cold and foul. The city had broken the river when it had flooded one too many times, had sealed it up in concrete to make sure it could never do damage again. Alex let it wash her clean, the shattered remnants of the bat flowing from her hands like seeds. She followed the river's course most of the way back to ground zero. She and Heli placed Heli's body back where it had been, and then they lay down together in the cold of that room. She didn't care what happened now, if the police came, if she froze to death on this floor. Stay, she told Hell Lai, hearing the thunder of their hearts beating together, feeling the weight of Hell Lai curled into her muscles and bones. Stay with me. But when she woke, a paramedic was shining a light into her eyes and Hell Lai was gone.